somebody I've known for almost a decade now has, um, has a, a brilliant presentation style and something that uh, I thought, as soon as I saw it, you know, we really have to bring this to, to OzCon. You will walk away with your mind blown by the next speaker. Please welcome up Dick Hart, founder and CEO of Skip. I don't really know I'm going to follow up that introduction. Um, thank you, Nat, for the opportunity to talk about something that I think is really important for this uh, community. So I'm going to talk about, you know, what is identity? What is identity 2.0? Why will it happen? Where are we now? So to start off with, what is identity? Well, I think identity is who you are. So who am I? Well, if you don't know Dick, this is me. Dick Clarence Hart, and for uh, many, you know, a number of people here, they remember my identity as being at Hip Communications, where I got involved in Perl, which eventually led to Active State uh, with O'Reilly. But uh, some of you probably don't know that I live in Canada, which is located here, for those of you that don't know. <laughs> and, um, you know, I live in the province of BC, which is over here, the city of Vancouver, which looks like this from the sky, courtesy of Google. We have the Olympics coming up, which is causing its own identity crisis. I live in a part of Vancouver called Gastown, which is located right here is where I live, which is also where our office is. In case you didn't notice, I'm male. This is when I was born, which makes me 42 over 19, over 21, over 25, and under 65. I went to school at UBC. I uh, now work at, at Skip. I'm the CEO. I'm the founder. I'm the board member. And to lots of my staff, I'm the bartender. I belong to uh, this organization, this organization, this organization. I blog here, I blog here, I have these email addresses. This one obviously indicates I'm part of the dot Mac revolution. I have these phone numbers, I bank here, and often enough they treat me well. I fly in this airline. I'm then part of this program, which and I fly off another time, Star Lance Gold, which gives me nice little perks, which I think are really important. So identity is also <laughs> what I like. I like the Canucks. I like the Grizzlies, at least until they got sold. <laughs> These are books that have influenced me, uh, magazines that I follow to find out what, what's going on, and uh, movies that I relate to. And obviously, I like Apple equipment. This is what I like to wear. This is what I like to drive. So that's me. That's part of my identity. So how is it conveyed? Well, historically, it's been verbal, where you trusted the person you're talking to. And then we had things like patents and ability. But anyone saw a knight's tale knows that those could be forged. And, you know, so we had official papers which enabled trust on a local scale, but modern identity has really been around photo ID, where we had passports and driver's license and student cards that enabled trust on a global scale so that I could prove that I was Canadian, that I live here, and that I went to UBC, and that I'm over 21. And, you know, so identity is what I say about me, what others say about me. Of course, what others say is more trusted. So, you know, identity is really reputation. You know, it's what others say about you. So where is identity used? Well, we have all kinds of identity transactions. Some of those are verbal. You meet somebody, you say your name, you say where you work. You may even do the same thing over the telephone or other things like a job application where you fill in a form. And all this stuff is unverified. You really need to trust the person you're dealing with. Well, what about verified identity? Well, a familiar example is when you go to a place like this, and of course you have to be over 21, and you walk up to the cashier and they say, you know, some ID. You then have a choice, of course, as to whether or not you even want to present ID. Of course, you don't get it by your boobs if you don't do that. And you can decide which ID to show, which is another important aspect. So you can show your passport, you can show your driver's license, some places even take your student card. So me, I'll go and show my driver's license, and they'll go and compare the photos on there, and they'll see that the subject actually does match a credential. And a nice feature of this is, of course, that only I can go and use my driver's license. And then they look at that and they see, okay, well, who issued it? Does it look like it's authentic? Is it still valid? And through that, they see it's a valid credential, assuming they trust the province of BC. And then they look at it and they need to figure out the age, and so they look to see what those parts are, and they see that, well, yeah, he is definitely over 21, so he's authorized to go and get his uh, vanilla stole. So, you know, things like this have dramatically reduced the friction in identity transactions. And photo ID, interesting enough, is an asymmetry trust because there's no relationship between the province of BC and the cashier, which provides extreme scalability. 
and the province is not a participant in the identity transaction, which provides a bunch of privacy features. They have no idea where and when I am showing that credential. And the credential is also reusable by any recipient who trusts the issuer, in this case, of course, the province of BC. So to summarize, identity is what I say about me, it's what others say about me, and modern identity is enabled the separation between the acquisition and the presentation of the credential, as well as the identification process and the authorization process. And it provides you know, extreme scale and a lot of privacy that I control, well, at least most of the time. So what is digital identity? Well, we have uh, site registration where we go and fill in often what is the same information at a whole bunch of different sites. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's obviously a bit of a hassle. <laughs> it could be simpler. You know, it, is it digital identity? Well, I think it is. You know, but it's unverified and it's like verbal information where when you meet somebody, except there's fewer trust cues because you can't see the person, you can't hear the person. In fact, it might not even, even be a person at the other end of the farm. <laughs> so what about username and password or say your secure ID token? Well, I think of this as just authentication and it proves that you are a directory entry. I consider this identity 1.0. It's directory centric. It's an opaque trust decision. There's a single authority. There's no credential choice. It's not portable. It's all in a silo. How do we mimic the real world? Where is my digital driver's license? How do I prove that I'm Canadian, that I live here, that I'm over 21, I went to UBC, I'm at Skip, I'm the CEO there, and I'm Star Alliance Gold, you know, important thing online. How do I prove any of this stuff online? It's not possible. Today, verified digital identity is not anything that you can give to the site, but it's what a website knows about you. So one of the best examples of that is your eBay reputation that you build up over time, but try and take that over to Craigslist. Is it your reputation or their reputation? It's closed. Or take all the books you bought at Amazon.com over to Barnes & Noble so they can help you out. You can't do that, it's a walled garden. We have all these identity silos and you can't move the identity around between them. It's site-centric with a site in the middle. And this is identity 1.0. What we really want is something that's user-centric where the user's in the middle and the user can move their identity from any site to any site. And then that gives us identity 2.0. So why will identity 2.0 happen? Well, in general, simple and open win. We have client server got replaced by HTTP and HTML, lease lines and frame relay got replaced by the internet because these things were silos. They were closed, they were complex. You had electronic mail systems like MCI mail, CompuServe mail, Props, X400, which were enterprise email solutions, but where are they today? They're gone. Something simple and open one, SMTP, which became ubiquitous and many consider the killer app of the internet, which of course led to its own problems, but that's another story. <laughs> So, simple and open wins. So today, you know, identity is in a silo. It's in walled gardens. It's closed and complex. Simple and open is inevitable, and being able to take your identity from any site to any site and being able to have identity to you is bound to happen. So what does it look like? Well, in identity 1.0, we have the user who goes to present some account credentials to a resource, and the resource goes and checks the directory and sees whether or not the user is allowed in. So to do this, the directory needs identity of the resource. And of course, that means the more resources, the more management there is around that. You know, there, it's a symmetrical trust relationship. And the policy decision is opaque. And if you think about it, it's sort of like if I went to the cashier, I told her my name, and then she phoned out the province of BC to decide whether or not I got to buy my bottle of vanilla. That's kind of crazy. So in identity 2.0, the user goes and there's a credential provider, they get their credentials, and they go to a resource, resource says what they want, they give that credential to the resource, sort of how it is in the real world, and that I can go and take that same credential and provide it to different resources, or that I can go and get credentials from a bunch of different providers and provide it to the same resource, or even provide them all to the same resource. So you have transparent policy, it's much simpler, it scales, and it's flexible. So who will drive this? You know, what about the users? Well, they have too many usernames and passwords. They really love the idea. We did some user testing. But of course, they won't pay, and they have little influence, so it's really unlikely. <laughs> what about the enterprise? They have a proliferation of partners, contractors, agents. They have a directory-centric model that's crumbling, but it's risky for them to lead anything like this. They have a lot of existing infrastructure. In many ways, they can't get there from here. The next logical step for them is federation, what I call identity 1.5. So it's unlikely they're going to drive it. What about government? 
Well, some of them are trying to go to e-government. They have all these different departments. They have these identity silos. So maybe, but it's pretty localized. They have cross-border jurisdictional issues. What about banks? Well, you know, there's been a bunch of uh, issues here around fishing and farming, so they're pretty motivated. In theory, they have a trust relationship with the user, so that's possible. What about the websites, the big portals? Well, I mean, you need really a whole identity ecosystem, so you need lots of users, you need a bunch of identity providers and service providers that are loosely coupled, and it's all of their best interest to go and share the user identity. So that's likely, but if you recall, Microsoft rolled out something called Passport that the Internet firmly rejected. And, you know, if you look at, well, why did that happen? Well, this is my speculation that it was expensive, didn't support LAMP, it was proprietary, it was really targeted for large sites only. Microsoft was at the center, and the only useful feature was single sign-on. But fortunately, we got a new era coming up. So I don't know why you guys are clapping about that. <laughs> so we've got uh, Flickr, which got acquired by Yahoo, which I was excited about being an investor in them. And uh, not only did they have a great site, but they had an API, so sites like Mapper could go and create sites be using the tags about geographic locations and show you pictures from around the US, which is kind of US-centric. But uh, being Canadian, always have an issue with that. They had sites like Crazy Dad that could go and take all the circle square photos and create some pretty amazing artwork. So you have all these sites doing cool things on top of Flickr, but it isn't just uh, in the consumer spaces. that happening. You have Salesforce Tom, they created S-Force, you have all these companies creating products that run on top of all the data you got in S-Force. And so this has been called Web 2.0, and O'Reilly has a conference, the next one coming up in October. And it's sort of, I view it as the difference between DOS and Windows, where in DOS you could only run a single app at a time, and in Windows you could run multiple apps. And at runtime, there's ability to be linking all the different components and all the different data. And in Windows, this was done in COM, and in Web 2.0, this is done with web services. So you can have applications like this where S-Force goes and grabs the maps from Google and you can go and create a map showing you where all your customer locations are. Or say Tribe creating a profile site so you can put your Flickr photos in there and your delicious links in there and your Amazon wish list into it. But how does Tribe go and get Halstead's wish list from Amazon.com? Well, Halstead had to give Tribe her Amazon.com username and password. I mean, does anyone else see a problem with this? There's no granularity. They have full access to everything. So you need claims in order for web service identity to really work. So I see that Web 2.0 is going to be one of the big drivers for Identity 2.0. Well, Microsoft is back again around this. And you have Kim Cameron with his Identity Web blog and the Laws of Identity, which, by the way, is actually some pretty good work. And you have InfoCard in the Meta System. And is this you know, Passport 2.0, or is it more like Identity 2.0? And so where are we technically on all this stuff? Well, we have XRI, XDI, which is a PARSE solution, but nothing around web services. There's the lightweight identity, which I think is being presented later on today, and as the name implies, it's lightweight, and there's little security. So it solves part of the problem. There's OpenID, which is good for blogs, but once again, little security. The Palsal guys wrote stuff, you know, talked about things yesterday, and it's open source. And it's got stronger security, but there's lots of loose ends and still under development. You have SAML, which is a logical progression for enterprises, and there's some open source there as open SAML, but there's some real risk redistribution issues around there because in order to go and put that into a package, you've got to go and get a license from RSA. So is it really open source? In my view, not really. Is it simple? Well, lots of people don't think so. And is it suitable for millions of sites that only need simple data? Probably not. You have the WS Star stuff led by Microsoft and their friends, and so they got claims, but is it once again suitable for millions of sites, and his info card really mimic how photo ID works. And even more important, are Google and Yahoo going to support something in Microsoft drives? So over at SKIP, which obviously is pronounced SKIP, um, and stands for the Simple Extensible Identity Protocol, we have sort of two message formats. One named value pairs that provides a very low barrier to entry for existing forms, and digitally signed XML for verified claims. And we've architected it to mimic how your uh, driver's license works. So what will win? You know, I obviously would like Skip to win, but I don't know who's going to win. But I do know that Identity 2.0 is inevitable, so that I'll eventually be able to go and prove online that I'm Canadian, that I live here, I'm over 21, I went to UBC, I work at Skip, and I am Starlance Gold. But if you want a world where it's your identity and not their identity, and the technology is open and not restricted, and you don't know dick about Identity 2.0, 
join the conversation, you know, my blog, I'm talking about this stuff, and together we can go and create an identity 2.0 architecture that works for all of us. Thank you.